This is, this is an introduction to the Cheetah Explorer. Explorer. Today, which is focused primarily on the Cheetah Explorer, I'm going to allude to and talk about a few of the seeds as well, and instead of allude to uh, functional seed geography and running sports. Uh, we have quite a few seeds now, now in the range, range of have, uh, for athletics, and, uh, and uh, I think it's important, important to kind of cover what seeds is good, is good for, for, for different, different uh, activities. So we're going to do that a little bit later. But the, so the focus is going to be here on the, on the Cheetah Explorer, which is really, really quite, quite interesting uh, design when we first exposed to this here. Um, it's a cross-functional foot. It, it basically goes back to, interestingly enough, original flex foot principles of design, at least in my mind. I mean, this is reminiscent of working with the Mod 3 uh, years ago. Um, which basically became the template for a lot of the feet that we have now. Uh, the Veriflex series, for example, is a modified version, a modular version of what we called the Modular 3, which is now the, the Veriflex modular. Um, but what's interesting about this is it's, it's taking the foot that broke the 11 second barrier and we're adding a heel to it and creating something that's an all around cross-functional design. So now we've got this lightweight, highly dynamic foot, which minimizes use of extra componentry and weight, um, connects the person directly to the, through the ground with an entirely carbon fiber system, um, which inherently gives them a little bit better proprioception as well. Um, and we can use this foot for activities of daily living, and we can use it for rec sports, jogging, even sprinting activities. So. Um, it's very interesting in that sense to take something of a foot of, of um, you know, the highly competitive athlete sprinting design and making this into an everyday leg and rec leg. Um, and it has really a lot of interesting functional potential. So obviously we've, we've got a long carbon fiber spring. Uh, the primary element of this is the what the pre-existing cheetah design prior to the cheetah extend and extreme. This is the original cheetah design, but with a split toe um, and a heel module added. Um, so obviously that long carbon spring is gonna give us very high energy return characteristics and a wide range of motion. Um, the heel module creates a stability mechanism and allows us to be able to walk on what was once just a sprinting and running uh, leg. The split toe is gonna give us that accommodation for uneven ground, a uh, little bit of multi-axial characteristic. With this design, we're effectively eliminating use of adapters, which makes it even lighter in terms of overall design, especially with a carbon fiber socket. Um, I'm going to show a couple different ways you can fabricate this um, in terms of using either the lamination connector or just laminating it directly which will somewhat give you a little bit better water resistance if you want to use this for uh, a surf leg, for example. Like all you'd have exposed to water in terms of metal components would be the heel attachment bolts. Um, so it'd be quite good for that application. And then what they've added with this is, is a small kit um, <clears throat> with the foot that gives you an EVA sole and a heel counter that you bond to the foot module. So I'll talk a little bit about how that's used and some different kind of customizations you can do to that. Um, but the intention with this is that you can actually fit it into the shoe or that you could fit it without a shoe and put some extra soling material on the outside. So there's a lot of ways you can customize this design to the person. Okay, one of the videos that I've included is this really pretty amazing video. Um, of one of the Cheetah Explorer users, I believe from Washington, who's using this prosthesis. And yeah, this is not running in a streaming mode, okay? But even if it was, I'm sure it would be lagging on your end. What I would encourage you to do is to watch this, open up the file on your own. Um, I'll actually see if I can minimize the screen here and run it not running in the PowerPoint. Let me see if I can get it to run here. Okay, so let's see if it'll run here for me. Yes, it will. All right. 
I'll just run this video. It's going to lag on your end, but it's a tremendous video uh, that shows basically a walking to jog to run transition with this gentleman using the Cheetah Explorer. Um, it's one of the best jogging and running gates I've seen. And he's able to go to a full sprint using the leg and back down to walking slowly and changing his speed. So again, this is what's tremendously interesting about this design is that we're, we're just, we're, you're getting so much out of what's effectively just a single carbon fiber foot module attached to the socket. Um, the ability to change speeds to go from very low impact to extremely high impact um, in one design is, is very unique and special, I think. So if this isn't streaming well on your end, I would, again, encourage you to open this up. Have a look at it a few times. I've been watching it a number of times myself. Uh, it's pretty amazing the results we can get here. Okay. So with that, there is a researcher <coughs> up at University of Washington, Megan McDuffie, who actually put together a study uh, on a number of people using this prosthesis. And interestingly enough, um, this design itself is a very much a grassroots project. It came from the idea itself from, from Greg Davidson of Davidson Prosthetics in, in Washington State in the U.S. Uh, he has built basically 64 prostheses incorporating uh, the cheetah blade, but then adding a Veriflex heel to it. The company kind of got wind of this and found it was quite a good idea, and he was getting these amazing functional results with people using it. So Megan did a study looking at um, uh, the self-assessed balance confidence uh, scores in patients using this prosthesis compared to their conventional prosthesis, and she made a poster presentation on this uh, this past year at the academy meeting um, over in the States. And so the objective... Uh, it's interesting, she's basically having people self-evaluate, again, conventional prosthesis they've been wearing to this modified cheetah. Uh, 36 subjects were given the survey. They basically filled out um, the activity-specific balance scale and sent, sent their results in via email and so on. Uh, 22 people completed the survey. And they found that basically a great number of these people had, had better balanced confidence while using the modified cheetah compared to their conventional prosthesis. Um, so the clinical relevance here that they identified was that people with balanced confidence issues who also need a lightweight and a strong design might benefit from using this type of foot. I, this is another thing. I'd highly encourage you to read this whole paper. It's very interesting. It alludes to advantages of not only balance, but proprioception and control, um, the great difference in how lightweight the prosthesis is. Um, but what I found interesting was that, you know, basically the data was analyzed per question on a scale of one to four, from no confidence to complete confidence. Uh, the greatest differences or increases in balance confidence they found was with respect to, you know, are you walking faster? Then you're on the pace playing sports and running, where the scores increased by 1.41, 1.32, and 1.50, respectively, um, with an average of 1.36 points higher with respect to the high activity questions um, on the assessment. And it was also interesting to see that with respect to perception of energy return with the prosthesis, the conventional prosthesis, they said 27.3% of the people said felt somewhat energetic to very energetic, but when they went to the modified cheetah, it was an 86.4% response. So it was quite a huge jump, saying that it was, you know, somewhat energetic to very energetic in terms of feel. Um, and with respect to weight of the prosthesis, 90% of the people stated that the weight of the prosthesis was more important or very important to them. Um, so again, a very, very interesting um, survey of results. It's an interesting paper to read, not too long, um, but a lot of significant uh, evidence there for this type of design. So to date, we find this system suitable for moderate to high active users, obviously. Um, people up to maximum weight of 147 kgs, minimum weight of 45 kgs, 
primarily transtibial users, um, and this is quite suitable for long residual use as well, as you'll see in a few minutes. Um, I'm sure there's going to be the question of, can I use this foot on a transfemoral user? Um, the answer is, at this point, I don't know of anybody who has. Um, I think the alignment of the pylon, as you might see later, might be a little bit of a challenge in terms of adapters and connectors to make it work, but I'm sure it's probably possible. Um, we just don't have a lot of information on that at this point. In terms of flex fit characteristics, obviously we've got something that has proportional response, uh, you know, it's custom layered carbon fiber according to weight and category. We've got an active heel, full length toe lever, something that has active tibial progression and is, you can consider waterproof. So by waterproof, we still recommend that um, a system like this is rinsed with fresh water after every use and dried, uh, especially if you're using it in a saltwater application. The weight of the foot module itself is 646 grams, and the foot comes in one size. So up to nine categories, one size, and there's a template on the toe where you'll grind down the foot to the size that you actually want, so somewhere between 24 and 30 centimeters. Um, it's actually assembled basically on a size 28 heel design, if you can imagine that. Um, so all the trimming that you're doing is basically off of the toe end of the foot module. So in terms of basic setup, I'm going to run through sort of the most frequently asked questions or, or, or fundamental basics you need to be able to set up this system. First, you need to determine what the foot length is that you're working with and trim to the line on the foot uh, using the template on the toe, which you see in the photo there. Uh, I think personally it's important to assess the footwear preferences of the person that you're dealing with. Uh, everybody comes in with, you know, sport prosthesis. There's different wants and needs that everybody has on their list. So I think it's important to determine with the amputee, are they going to wear a shoe with this or are you going to try to configure something that's got an externally bonded sole and no shoe? It's certainly possible. Uh, we're just supplying the heel counter that you see. Um, in the photo here, I just got the mouse over that heel counter portion that's bonded onto the top of the heel. And then there's the UVA soling there that runs along the bottom that you can trim out and uh, grind basically to the width of the insert that's in the shoe. Some people, including the folks that uh, Greg Davidson was working with in Washington, he makes a custom filler. You actually saw on the previous slide here with the study, uh, you can see that custom toe filler and heel uh, configuration there so that he'd get basically no movement while it was in the shoe. Okay. So you could do that as well. Then you're going to bond the soling material, grind and match uh, that to the insole, ideally. Make sure that you've got a snug fit in the shoe uh, with no excessive movement. I have fit these without putting the toe filler in, and it's really quite secure in the shoe. Uh, the toe filler probably just makes it even more firm. And then you're going to bond on the heel counter. The heel counter is nice, again, because that provides some cradling for the posterior aspect of the blade when someone's going to a full sprint and they're really pounding this thing. It just gives you some, it counteracts some of those heavy forces and cradles that blade a little bit. So it's really quite, quite nice. Uh, some additional perhaps impa impact protection with the use of that counter. Then what you want to do is determine the length of the prosthesis. Uh, with this particular system, you do want to uh, match it to the sound limb length. Uh, many of you familiar with our other running feet? Um, know that we recommend making those longer. So, for example, cheetah extends, extremes, <clears throat> flex runs. We're always lengthening the prosthesis by 35 to 50 mils. Uh, with this one, you're not, okay? Because, again, you're using this for walking and you're using it for running. Uh, you're pretty much matching the overall length to the sound limb itself. Um, you're going to trim an excessive, any kind of excessive proximal length from the pylon. I generally leave it, you know, when I'm first setting these up, I leave a few extra centimeters because I know I'm not drilling it straight away. 
um, and a lot of times you might want to tinker with the length a little bit. So the last thing you want to do is cut this too short. So leave a little bit of excess that you can play with later. You need to determine your socket adduction requirements. Uh, and just a rule of thumb that I do, I'm typically adding three to five degrees to these in terms of adduction. Again, to accommodate for generally speaking a narrower base of support when someone starts to run. So you do need to think about that. That's going to help keep the foot a little bit more flat on the floor when they take off to a sprint or, or a fast jog. If you're using a check socket and you're not quite through that phase yet, I would recommend personally reinforcing the check socket with like just a thin bit of lamination and, and glass um, over it, you know, before you assemble that onto the blade. You're going to be wrapping this thing up onto the blade. Um, or bonding it in some way, and typically just the check socket by itself is going to be fairly, fairly wimpy. Um, so it usually needs a little bit of reinforcement. And I would recommend using an alignment fixture of some sort. Uh, the ones I've got in the photos here is just a modified plate that I made in the workshop and the Hosmer jig, which I prefer. So this is this slide is intended to give you. This is probably one of the most important ones to give you some of the fundamentals about the foot itself and how you want to set it up in the sagittal plane. Um, there's a min-max posterior wall length given of 348 to 521 millimeters. Uh, there's no specific shortest cut length given in the materials. Um, you can say that it's on the order of 348 mils. I think personally you could probably trim it down a little bit shorter and still make it work, um, but that'll give you a ballpark estimate. Um, there is a minimum clearance requirement that you need from the socket to the foot that you see in the bottom right part of the diagram. So between the bottom of the socket, if you've got a very long limb or a sinus, you need about 32 mils between the socket and the foot module down there at the radius to make it work. Overall length, again, we said before we're going to match to the sound side measurement. Interestingly enough with this thing, this is one of the more important things to pay attention to. Seems a little counterintuitive at first, but it works 100%. You actually need to extend the socket a little bit um, <clears throat> compared to the client's normal alignment. Uh, seems a little bit strange, but what it does is it really preloads that blade up, and it actually helps you as well to get the cross section of the socket up there aligned closer to the posterior middle one third of the foot. Okay, so that's more or less what you're looking at pretty consistently with setting these sockets up. You're following, the socket alignment's going to follow more or less the attitude of that pylon in the sagittal plane. Um, if you fight against this, what you tend to find, or if you try to add flexion to the socket too much, you find you end up with quite a lot of drop off when they're walking and when they're running with this. It feels too soft on the toe. So um, this, is, this is an important thing to pay attention to with this. Adduction, again, I mentioned before, adding a, little, a few degrees compared to the client's normal alignment that does help you out accounting for this narrower base that they're going to take when they start to run. And in the transverse plane, as we recommend with other running feet, generally you're going to be externally rotating the blade about five degrees, perhaps a little more. It depends on the person. Um, so that's quite important to eliminate whips. Uh, and to keep the blade tracking nice and clean in swing phase, that, that rotation is quite important. Um, you'll also note here that you need a little bit of space between about five mil between um, the socket and the blade itself on the mounting, um, and that's to allow for that pylon to flex a little bit as well. So you don't want that butted right up against um, the blade there. Okay. There's a couple different ways that you can bond this blade onto the socket, um, and you'll get you'll, you'll get lots of debate from different people about what's the best way to do this. Um, I'm going to recommend basically two different ways that you can do this. One's the direct lamination method, okay, and you can you can see the steps outlined basically in the kit that you received from us for the direct lamination method. That's really what's being promoted uh, globally by the company. Um, it's using a Fabtech Plus Series composite adhesive with an uh, injection gun um, to bond it, and then doing basically a braid lamination directly over the top. Um, 
tying in extra external carbon fiber braid that you see in the little caption on number 15 in the bottom right. I'll show some other photos of that later. There is a video on uh, the internet that you can watch this fabrication process from start to finish. Um, it's a method that kind of goes back to old school flex foot assembly. I would say this is a fairly useful technique um, if you don't have a alignment fixture to work with. This is one way to put things together. Um, also, again, direct lamination, if you're looking to put something together and you don't want to have any connectors proximally, you want it as waterproof as possible, you know, you're making a surf leg for somebody, this is probably a pretty reasonable way to do it for, for that application. Um, the downside to doing direct lamination, obviously, is that you don't have adjustment afterwards. So, alternatively, if you want to have future adjustment or angular adjustments, um, and this means uh, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, uh, external internal rotation of the blade, and you want to be able to do those things um, after it's been finally laminated and put together. Uh, the other, the other thing that this adds for is that, um, I'll talk about it later, you can stack wedges to offset anterior posterior placement of the socket and foot, is to basically use a lamination connector. So a lot of you would be familiar with this using uh, cheetahs um, in the past, or modular threes, for example, or some of our other feet. Um, it's a connector that fits onto the back of the socket. It's laminated, um, generally speaking, on as a second lamination on top of your first laminated socket. The photo I've got top right is basically it mounted onto a reinforced check socket using some epoxy putty. Okay. The advantage again with this is that you can use alignment wedges um, after final fabrication. Those wedges are placed um, between uh, the connector and the blade and you're using some grit in between um, the, the surfaces of the alignment wedge, and that allows you again to dorsiflexion, uh, allow for dorsiflexion, plantar flexion of the foot, internal and external rotation if you need that. Um, and if you stack wedges of equal size oppositely, you can get an anterior offset of the socket versus foot. Okay. The key point is with these is that you've got to use grit between the surfaces, and you do need to use, especially for angular adjustments, you need to use the spherical washers in addition to the bolts. Um, that prevents any excessive torque and stress on the bolts um, and keeps that a nice sound and stable fixture up top. Um, I think this is really, this is also a nice thing to use if you want the socket finished off very beautifully. Direct laminations don't always look so pretty. So for a temporary trial setup, we get a lot of questions about this. Um, you can use epoxy putty or some other adhesive to attach a lamination adapter to the socket um, while mounted in the alignment fixture. Or you can use a dummy spacer of similar depth if you're gonna transfer it out later. Technically, all you need at this point is something to create the anterior space and to get your socket placement correct uh, with respect to the foot. You can then wrap the pylon assembly and hose clamps. Uh, now, prior to the, the uh, wrap setting, you can wrap the pylon directly onto that. I recommend to people to do a figure eight wrap uh, directly proximal and distal over the blade itself and over the clamps um, to basically prevent the blade from slipping. And this gives you a pretty nice way to set things up temporarily if you're using a lamination connector um, and just get somebody, you know, bouncing on it, running on it a little bit, walking, you know, assessing if you've got the length right, if you're in the ballpark with your alignment. Um, this is a reasonable way to do it. So again, hose clamps over the wet wrap, crank on those things nice and tight, and then I like to wrap over the top of that. And again, tie in that blade really well, proximal and distal, so that you know it's not gonna slip in that assembly. I also use just a very thin layer of cellophane um, over the blade just to prevent all the resin from getting all over the blade and everything like that. 
Another question that comes up with assembly with these uh, for temporary setup is, you know, can I use the Cheeto alignment adapter, which is the FSX5007? You'll find it in our catalog. Not a lot of people know about this part. It's a nice modular endoskeletal sort of temporary connector to use. It's primarily used with the Cheetah Extends and Extremes. Uh, what I've found with this is that depending on your socket, it may or may not work with a Cheetah Explorer. Um, why it might not work is that it sometimes, because it has a certain uh, depth to it in terms of anterior-posterior position, it can push your socket too far forward or anterior relative to the foot um, for your alignment. So that's, that's one sort of issue. I suppose if you have a narrow AP socket, a smaller socket in terms of overall dimensions, you might be able to get this to work and it could be possibly quite helpful for you. Um, this mechanism basically allows you to you know, change transverse rotation of the foot, plantar flex, dorsiflex, change the length, slide it up and down on the pylon, lock it in. You, you can change anything you want to with this adapter, so it's quite nice that way. And it has a drilling template as well. Um, you'll see there on the top right picture, so you can see how you can drill the holes for your final assembly once you're ready. So if you are able to use this, it's, it's quite good. I just find that that anterior offset um, is sometimes a little extreme. Uh, for a socket in this photo, for example, it's too much. It pushes things too far forward. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to everybody. Okay, another point here, I've got a few examples of where um, you know, we've, we've tried in-house here using a neutral socket alignment with this foot, and it hasn't worked very well. Um, again, using that alignment with five to seven degrees of extension has tended to work the best with this. Um, you'll also note here, when you drop that line down from socket bisection, you'll see the difference in where that line crosses the foot. So again, with that neutral alignment, you're going to be pushing the socket a little bit more forward of the one third mark where you where you would like to see it. Whereas when you get it in that extended state, you're matching that position up a little bit better. So hopefully you can see that on the photos here. Okay. I'll show some videos a little bit later of the difference again between the neutral socket and having that extended uh, for walking and running. I've added this for you as kind of a checklist of things to look for in terms of your dynamic alignment, walking, jogging, then running. Um, there are certain sort of things that you need to, to check out. And if you haven't done a lot of running legs before, this is usually what we get a lot of questions about. What do I look at? What would be the indicators that tell me if something's wrong? Um, basically, you want to get someone standing, check your static alignment, and then get them walking. Uh, make sure that there's no hyperextension of the knee happening. We are using a more extended socket, so if you were finding some knee hyperextension, that would be something that you'd probably have to address. Maybe you need to add a little bit of flexion to the socket. Maybe you need to shift the socket forward relative to the foot a little bit. Okay, all the recommendations I'm giving you here are baseline ones as starting points. You're going to look next at the rollover transition. You'll contact the mid stance toe off, make sure that's nice and smooth. Again, what we've found with neutrally aligned or flexed sockets is that we tend to get more drop-off. Um, we want to look for some positive anterior support and late stance, a nice even stride length, level shoulders and pelvis, and the foot being nice and flat on the floor in the coronal plane of mid-stance. When you go to a jog, you're looking for some similar things as you would with the walk. You're looking, again, for good knee stability. You want to make sure they're not hyperextending when, they're, when they start to jog and run. Uh, you want to verify good terminal support in mid-stance. They're not falling off the front. The foot's not too soft for them. We want to verify good adduction and outset. Generally speaking for that, you're looking for the foot to be nice and flat on the floor in the coronal plane at mid-stance. So when you watch them run and you're looking from the back, um, you should see that foot nice and flat on the floor. If they're on the outside of their foot, most likely you haven't adducted the socket enough and you're gonna to have to add adduction to the socket. Most of the time that works versus adding a lot of outset. Um, outset for the blade, 
you know, you can find these very centrally positioned directly underneath the bisection of the socket um, in the coronal plane up to maybe a centimeter outset, but they're not tremendously outset in most cases. They just have a little bit of extra adduction added. You want to pay attention to width. Usually if you've got some kind of whipping action that's happening, if, if it's in fact the prosthesis, it's usually from a lack of toe out. So, uh, you know, if you're seeing some sort of um, lateral whip or something like that, it usually means you need to externally rotate that foot. Look for some good arm swing or try to encourage arm swing with the person that you're working with. If the prosthesis is short, and you know, again, tinkering with length with one of these things is one of the one of the areas where you spend probably the most time in the beginning. You're going to look for uneven shoulders and pelvis. The real typical indicator for me is looking for a shoulder dip. That's what usually becomes most apparent that the length is really inadequate. Uneven stride length. Um, they sometimes have an unstable knee. And uh, another cue is having some excessive internal foot rotation as they reach out for for a longer step or stride. If the prosthesis is too long, you typically see ex excessive knee flexion when they're standing. You may see some circumduction. A real typical sign is toe catching. Every once in a while, they're catching that toe on the ground as they swing through. Um, an uneven stride length, vaulting sometimes. Uh, that's, that's a real typical one on the contralateral side. And again, uneven shoulders and pelvis. So you have the, the shoulder and the pelvis lifted up on the prosthetic side. Um, and usually they're struggling to clear the floor. That's true. So I hope this gives you kind of a short quick reference card or checklist that you can use as you walk through fittings and go, yeah, okay, most of this stuff is checked out. That's the intention with this. Right. Now, again, what we've seen... Um, with that neutral socket alignment, I've got some videos that, again, see the link that James would have sent to you. Um, I'll see if these play within the presentation. If not, and they don't seem to be, let me just exit here real briefly. I'll try to play these for you. Okay, so what we typically see with the drop-off, Chris here trying one of these out at our place, and Okay, it's not tremendously pronounced, but it is there. He drops off in late stance, and we found both subjectively, objectively, he, he was feeling it. He noticed it, um, especially once he got to jogging and running. It was way too soft. So that was with the socket neutrally aligned. And then what we did was we added that five to seven degrees of extension, and he's got better terminal support. He felt this was much better for walking, much better for running once he got jogging. Okay, and the other thing that we did with, with his foot was we actually added a little bit of crepe, a little bit of the black crepe underneath the toe. Okay, so this particular foot doesn't have a drop toe design, uh, like for example, a Veriflex XC. It's got quite a curl on the toe, uh, the pre-existing cheetah uh, template. So you know, we just added a little bit of crepe underneath the toe, and that gave him just a little bit more push at the very end that he liked. So that's another little trick that you can use when you do these fittings, um, you know, to compensate. You could take a little bit of crepe off the heel and you know, add a little bit on the toe, and combinations of these things will work. And by the way, I suppose another, another good use of crepe is if you were, for example, off on your length, um, you know, after you did your final fabrication on your length, you found that you were a little bit short, you could always add a little bit of crepe or rubber soling on the bottom of one of these to, to lift the person back up just a little bit if it's a few mils. All right, so hopefully those, those two videos, again, if they're not streaming really well for you, open them up separately, have a look. Um, I think that will illustrate the point. And then I've just got a brief jogging video here as well. Um, of Chris when um, he got up on this thing jogging. Okay, so he was he was able to get to a nice comfortable jog with the leg very easily. 
first go. Um, felt like it was quite a bit more dynamic than anything you used before um, for sport, including the Vera, comparing to the Veriflex XC, um, Reflex Rotate, for example, another one that he's used pretty frequently in the past. So um, it was interesting. And he also noticed the, the, the light weight, the difference in weight of the unit, um, even with all the wrap that we had just over the check socket. Some other little tech tips that I can pass on. I, I suppose these days it's more reminders. Uh, we talk about it all the time. I still think not everybody does it on a regular basis, but it is really useful. I think, especially if you haven't set up a lot of running legs before, um, it's very useful. Just doing some simple video recordings, uh, coronal and sagittal plane. Um, you know, even if you don't have a way to measure what's going on, if you have a way to play back, frame by frame. That's really the best. If you can frame by frame playback a video, you can really identify where you've gone wrong and exactly how much you need to correct. Um, if you do have access to things like P&O data from Silicon Coach or another uh, video, uh, video analysis software, it's particularly useful if you use some tape markings on the foot and on the socket. So for example, bisection of the socket at mid patellar tendon, if you have a way to mark, um, you know, the anterior contact point, anterior third of the foot, for example, just, just a place that you can landmark. When you run the video back, you'll be able to identify angular uh, changes that are happening, particularly when someone lands on the foot and where they take off. And you can establish those relationships between the foot and the socket. And if you're able to measure the angular changes that exist and where you want to see that foot placement actually when they land in stance or when they take off, um, you can then go ahead and make an angular change with the, the foot um, and make a correction in one move as opposed to maybe multiple moves. Um, without video and without a way to analyze and measure, a lot of times you find yourself you know, pulling this thing apart, which is like an exo build, so you're ripping all this material apart, putting it back together. It's a tedious process. So if you can do that in one step versus six steps and do it precisely, you find that you're wasting a lot less time. Um, so again, you'll identify those angular corrections, linear corrections, even rotational corrections. You can identify a whip in the coronal plane. And you can get an idea of how much. It gives you a ballpark on how much you might need to make a rotational change. So then you can use that video just repeat this kind of type of process until basically the performance is satisfactory. At which point you can decide which way you want to transfer and finish. So I've talked about the fact that you can use the lamination connector method with alignment wedges, or you can go ahead and do direct lamination. Okay. Um, again, um, advantages with the lamination connector method is that it simply allows for alignment with wedges after you've made the final socket and put this whole thing together. So if you want to have future adjustment, like the best range of adjustment, aside from using crepe on the bottom of the foot, um, this is really the best way to go. Um, the other way is direct lamination. And again, that's maybe a, perhaps a better solution if you are looking for even greater water resistance and, and qualities like that. Um, if you're using the lamination connector, make sure you transfer and you save your, your alignment. Laminate the socket if you're moving from a check socket phase. Um, bond the lamination adapter to the socket using our epoxy putty or something else that's very rigid. That's the main point. Um, and you're going to bond that onto your first lamination and then tie it in completely with the second lamination. You'll mark and drill holes in the blade. I usually drill first and then trim off any excess afterwards and then install your bolts and torque okay there have been a number of questions for folks that have used the system already just in terms of what's included in the kit and what's not included in the kit so i wanted to be really clear about this because sometimes it gets confusing with part numbers and so on if you are ever confused just please feel free to talk to customer service and and yeah tell them you're confused and what to order and what do you need to put it all together and they'll help you out um, this is, again, intended to be sort of quick reference. You can also look at 
Archita Explorer brochure, which goes um, over a lot of this information as well on the back side of the sheet. That's also in the link that, um, that James sent you. So the kit itself includes, if you order a Cheetah Explorer, you get the Cheetah, the foot module itself, obviously, the Cheetah Explorer sole and the heel counter that you bond on and grind. Um, the template um, for grinding the foot, that's actually adhered to the foot module itself, so you don't have to worry that, about that. You'll see that on the foot itself when you pull it out of the box. You actually get a cartridge of the Plus Series adhesive if you're looking to do direct lamination. So that's included in the box with it. There's an alignment poster, <clears throat> which is helpful for direct lamination. It helps you kind of record or sketch the prosthesis on a piece of paper and then record toe outs and different measurements um, so that you can try to get everything back together if you're not using an alignment fixture. And there's an instruction, obviously. Um, the lamination connector kits, if you want to use those, those are sold separately. And there are still three of them, which is a little bit confusing. There was a new kit introduced with the Cheetah Extend and Extreme that covers categories one to nine. So if that's simple for you to remember, you can get the 5009. That sort of works for everything. You can still get the older Cheetah connectors. It's basically the same unit for cat one to six or seven to nine if you want to get specific about it. They include the lamination connector plate, the alignment wedges, hardware, and a little lamination kit. Okay. Um, other accessories, there's the adhesive if you want to buy more of the adhesive from us, or the dispenser for the adhesive. Um, those are separate things that are ordered there. Okay. And the grinding template, again, I mentioned is, is attached to the foot module itself. The sole and the heel counter, you glue those onto the foot. Uh, there were some questions that people had about what to bond that to the foot with. Generally speaking, whether you're bonding this material or something else, I'd recommend that you you rough up the uh, the bottom of the blade, so the foot module itself, rough that up with some coarse sandpaper, clean it with isopropyl alcohol, um, use some contact adhesive on the rubber soling itself and then on the blade itself, let it dry. Um, you can actually tack the foam or the, the, um, in the oven for just a few seconds if you'd like to, but actually I've bonded them without putting them into any heat source. Just bond them directly. Um, and then you can tack down the edges of the rubber sole with uh, like a 495 Loctite, like a super glue. It, it prevents the edges from coming away over time. It's a little bit better than the contact adhesive for the edges. Um, and they've, they've actually added a template on the box to help you with grinding soles. But, but again, it's going to be customized to the user and what type of foot insole they have uh, in their shoe primarily. Um, the alignment sheet, again, that's for those of you not working with uh, an alignment fixture. Uh, if you're setting this up freehand, it's a useful thing to use to sort of save measurements and, and get your alignment right. Uh, and then there's the plus series adhesive we, we talked about before that you'll see in the video. And finally, there's a 36-month warranty with the Cheetah Explorer, okay? So it carries the same warranty we have with a lot of our premium feet, which is quite nice. Um, additional running solutions for Moses. So obviously, we have quite a range in terms of running feet, um, and I'm not even touching on the old uh, Veriflex modular or Mod 3 design, as you know it. Uh, I'm just the intention with these next slides is to give you some indications like of who might be better for one system than another. So with the Veriflex XC and the Reflex Shock, those are actually Unity compatible. So if you had somebody who was interested in using one foot for their recreational and sport and running, plus activities of daily living, and especially they want to use vacuum, um, these are two great options. Uh, some of you might ask, why did I not put Reflex Rotate? On here. Well, Reflex rotates a fantastic foot, but a lot of people who are running or jumping um, find that the bit of extra rotation is distracting or a bit unnecessary and a little disconcerting at times having that in there. So <clears throat> most people I know that do running activities are quite happy having something that has just a lot of energy storage and return and or vertical shock. So these two feet have quite a lot of vertical compression. The XC has 10 mil, which I think a lot of people aren't aware of. 
and the reflex shock has 21 mil of vertical compression. So um, why would you pick XC over reflex shock? XC is very lightweight. It's low profile, um, and that would be the main reason <coughs> that you would go there compared to the reflex shock. The reflex shock would be my go-to is if I had a guy like Daryl here in the bottom right corner who's jumping off of things or doing some really hardcore running, um, and really needs that extra vertical compression, I'd be going with a reflex shock for somebody like him. So extremely rugged applications, jumping, kicking type type things, um, I'd probably go with the shock. The Flex Run, uh, we know, is really a proven design, absolutely fantastic for people who are purely doing the recreational jogging and trail running, marathons, Ironman, uh, comes with the Nike sole. I'd go with this versus a cheetah explorer <clears throat> if i've got somebody who's seriously just they really want to get into distance running and that's what they do <clears throat> and they want something very specific to that application i'd go with this versus the explorer and then of course we got the cheetah extreme and extend now these are really for the folks that are getting more competitive um, these are the most upgraded of the cheetah designs they were made for folks that were competing in, in London, for example, um, and breaking records and so on. So this is really, in my mind, these, these are two options for more competitive athletes. Doesn't mean if you're not competitive, you can't use it, but it's probably best for these folks. And they're also more or less focusing on sprinting activities. The curve on the extreme has been made more aggressive. You know, it has a, has a more uh, posterior swing on the radius than any of our other feet. The idea is that that gives you a much more powerful kick in terms of the response compared to anything else. It's really aggressive. Um, you'll notice as well, there's a subtle, but a, a definite um, wave to the forefoot on the blade. So they've lengthened the toe on it and they actually created that little anterior wave that you see on the foot. I'll just drop the mouse where it is that actually makes it a little stiffer and gives it a little bit more pop um, for these athletes when they're doing short sprints. And this is a design that con uh, can, uh, is compatible with the Nike Spike Sole and up to 147 kilogram weight limit. The Extend is a little softened version of the Extreme. So it doesn't have quite the same aggressive posterior curve that you see on the Extreme. Uh, and it doesn't have that aggressive flattening on the toe or extension that you see on the extreme. So it's a little more gentle. It's generally indicated for a sprint to more of a distance run, as you see by 400 to 5,000 meter indication there. Um, it's a little lighter. It's a little less aggressive in terms of pop than what you get from the extreme. Okay. So, you know, this is maybe for somebody who maybe they're going from distance running they're more of a serious distance runner they want to get more into sprinting they are competing um, this is possibly a good option for for somebody like that again rated uh, up to 147 kgs and you can use that nike spike sole with this one as well i've also got the photo shown here with the the uh the cheetah uh, modular adapter there so again that's the adapter i was talking about before that's really nice to use with the um the extend and the extreme models. Finally, we have the junior running solution. So there are three feet that are running feet for uh, kids. So we get the Cheetah Explorer Junior, the, the Flex Fit Cheetah Junior, and the Flex Run for Junior. Um, these are all really fantastic options for kids. Um, the Explorer Junior has been pretty popular thus far well, with a lot of kids in the last year. Um, you can set that up with direct lamination, or you're going to use the adult lamination connector attachments that I've discussed before with that. Uh, the same thing for the Cheetah Junior and the Flex Run Junior, you're going to use the adult componentry with those setups. Okay. Um, so that's just a reminder about these feet and a few specs on those uh, for your reference. Just let us know if you have any questions about those. And that's all we have for today.